were you told at the time of your father's death? I was told that your father has had an accident. But that was the cover story told by the CIA. My father, Frank Olson, was an army scientist. His research group had a relationship with the CIA. They take him to New York Tuesday morning, early Saturday morning, he's dead. What was my father doing? What was the CIA doing? What happened there? The released CIA documents deal with a project codenamed MK Ultra. There was in it a story of a CIA experiment on an unwitting civilian who was given LSD. You're the one on stage tonight, Dr. Olson. <laughs> You're all a bunch of jokers. This has been the shift from thinking that my father's death was a mysterious suicide to knowing that it was a CIA atrocity. This is 1975. There were a lot of questions about the integrity of the U.S. government. The government was so eager to shut this down. The tragedy that happened to the family was very deep and very real. Eric's whole life has been sucked into this terrible hole. The CIA was using LSD on people, but I think the real bad was something worse. He's a man that was profoundly distressed about what he was learning. Startling new information. Frank Olson, a former CIA scientist, may have been murdered. If you thought somebody was detrimental, you would have no problem dealing with him. But then the question is, who ordered that? The United States began to do things which put its own democratic institutions in great jeopardy. And my father was in the center of that. Frank was somebody who has secrets, and he was dangerous. I can't tell you more. Everybody, thanks so much for being here, and congratulations on making this Beautiful, confounding, incredible work. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Morris, uh, how did this start for you? When did you find out about the, the Olsen family, Eric Olsen, and when did you decide that you wanted to really work with actors? <laughs> really? Two questions. I almost... Did you just answer my question with really? <laughs> <laughs> I did indeed. Always wanted to work with actors. And I'd like to work with these actors again. Once wasn't enough. So do a, sort of an, another, another, another series like this, another story, but so have this as like almost an, an anthology docu-series? Why the docu part? <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be fun. So how did you, uh, so how did you come across uh, Eric Olson's story uh, of But in father? answer to your question, yes, I would like to do more. I'd like this to be the beginning of, you know, a whole new line of film projects. For you. For and me. Me, and <laughs> me and for them. <laughs> when did you come across this story and at what point did you decide that this story needed these kinds of reenactments? I know you've worked with actors before. Obviously, there were actors in the reenactments of The Thin Blue Line. But this uh, is much more intense, the, the work with actors here. So when did you decide that this story lended itself well to that format? And don't question the word format or something. Just, you know. Oh, I was just about to. I know you were. I can see it in your eye. The twinkle. Let's talk about reenactment. <laughs> Let's open that can of worms. Yeah, why not? Um, Whenever you're involved with a lie, it seems that drama is the best way to tell a story about it. Um, all of the drama in Wormwood is based on a pile of documents given to the Olson family by the CIA. And I should ask everyone here, if you were given a pile of documents by the CIA, would you think that they represented the absolute undisputable truth. Why the laughter? Nervous laughter. Nervous laughter. Nervous laughter. Well, 
I can tell you what I think. I think you get a pile of documents from the CIA and you immediately wonder, are they all lies? And if they're not all lies, what part is the truth and what part is lies? Because we all know that if you really want to lie effectively, I think it's in the rule book on lying, always include a little bit of the truth in your lies, and that really screws people up. Um, so this pile of documents that came from the CIA, which are at the heart of Wormwood, I thought, let's turn them into a little movie inside of the movie. And that's what we did. And you, you turn, turn the, the lies into a little movie, and that's, that comes with working with the actors, is what you're saying. The actors were a big help in the drama, because without them, there wouldn't have been any. <laughs> Guys, what is it like working with him on set when you ask a question? <laughs> what is my character supposed to be doing in this you scene? You don't I... ask the question. <laughs> When, at what point I mean, did you Errol's, learn that on set with Errol? Oh, I mean, I knew Errol, Errol and I, I we met Errol. Way back. Well, I met him like a year and a half or so before we started, and I had met him several times. But um, I like it when nobody talks too much. To me, that's when things are going really great. <laughs> like, nobody's saying anything. Thumbs up. So we were a perfect fit. <laughs> For each other and actually when Errol would say things sometimes or do things like you know Errol would operate the camera sometimes and point it at a place that was not lit and you'd walk over there and see if we found something you know and is a wonderful spontaneous quality that is all I require as an actor someone who appreciates spontaneity someone who creates spontaneity someone who's not predictable you know. good lord you got them. Yeah. That's, that's so strange. I think, I think of the, the, the predictable as being a form of taxidermy. <laughs> a recreation. A reenactment, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, a head stuffed, preferably, on an oil walnut plaque. <laughs> Do you find that you are... Not necessarily recreating these lies, obviously, because we don't like the word recreation here. But you use here, <laughs> you must like it. Sure, I'm sure. Why not? Uh, but when it comes to working with the actors at a certain point, and people are discussing the scene and figure out the figuring out the best way to play this scene together, and the best way to sort of effectively convey the emotions of the scene, you are essentially creating more lies on top of the lies that are already a part of this document. Sounds right. I'm just trying to get my bearings with you here, Errol. <laughs> Molly, when did you learn that you couldn't ask Errol any questions on set? Uh, well, I also don't like anyone to talk to me very much when I'm working. So, no, do you know? So, who had the best no, pranks but, on set? But, but here, here is the thing that is uh, it was my experience working with Errol, and is my experience actually watching this. Uh, program is, you know, when you watch him doing the interviews in Wormwood, and he is this kind of filmmaker that he is listening, and he's listening with his whole self, you know, and uh, there is something about performing for a, a, a director who is watching and listening at that level, that even though it's not necessarily spoken, that's a collaboration because you know it's being seen and then what comes back to you is, it, that is the collaboration that happens in the moment of shooting film. Um, and that's why, I mean, that's one of the reasons I really, really wanted to work with him on this project. But also, you know, this is a mystery and Errol did talk to me about this idea of the drama in the piece being one more way of thinking about the mystery. It's sort of like one more tool to discover like, well, what if these people did this thing? Then would that make sense? You know, in the, in the um, so I didn't ever think about it as a recreation or a reenactment of, of anything, particularly because the story is so much from the perspective of the son 
who Errol uh, interviews a lot in the, in the show. Well, it ends up adding, uh, it illuminates the mysteries that are being talked about, but it also adds more mystery to the, to the, to the sort of core mysteries of, of, of the story. Do you feel like that? I wanted you to explain further. Well, I think, uh, as I said before, where the actors are creating a lie on top of the other lies, you, by using actors on top of these interviews with the actual, you know, people whose family it is, are adding more mystery for the audience. They have to sort of parse between the fiction that you're kind of creating as well. Um, when I say that it's all lies, you know, M M Molly Parker is not Alice Olsen. Uh, Peter Sarsgaard is not Frank Olsen. Um, Christian Camargo is not Robert Lashbrook. These are actors playing a role. But done correctly, this is my belief. Uh, it brings you deeper into who these people might have been, deeper into the mystery of what happened. It's just one more tool to thinking about a crime. Uh, and I think a very effective one. You started as, I mean, one of your jobs before being a filmmaker, or maybe while you were filmmaking as well, uh, was as a private detective. Do you find that you approach your filmmaking and your storytelling like a private detective as well, and any tool that you can find to tell the story and to sort of gather evidence you'll, you'll use? Why not? There are obvious differences, but there are many, many, many similarities. I mean, it, it definitely felt like when we were doing a scene, some of the scenes, there's no information at all. And, and then some, when it, it deals with Frank Olsen, there's more information. But with the scenes that had, didn't have much information, it really did feel that Errol was using us as a way to seek the truth. Uh, you, giving us a situation, giving people a situation, the little bit of facts that we knew, and allowing the scene to sort of become what it is, he found a kernel of truth to propel the story forward. And, and so it did feel like part of a detective you know, uh, work. How were those scenes scripted? Because obviously there are very specific lines that come from the documents and come from the court testimony we see. I, I love that moment where we see you say this line that then reappears later in the, the sort of court testimony. But how were a lot of those scenes scripted? Because so much of it is dialogue-less and it is just people sort of interacting with each other quietly and you're getting a sense of their body language with each other and how they lived together. What, was it, what, did, what did those scenes look like on the page? I mean, they were, they were fully written, fully realized. Yeah. There was a script. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've said this before. Errol um, said when he met me that he preferred me when I wasn't speaking as an actor. <laughs> so... Um, uh, high praise. So, yeah. Um, I do think I'm... I'm, I'm it is high praise. Yeah, I, I think I'm particularly good when I'm not speaking. I, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, just this whole idea that this is somehow a lot different than what we normally do is a complete fallacy. I mean, you think of... I did a movie where I played Robert Kennedy, and we reimagined, you know, the, the assassination of JFK and being there, and we reenacted moments in that movie all over the place. They were things that happened that we were trying to make accurate to that time. I mean, it's just something that happens so constantly in the business that, um, that it really was the same. The only difference for me as an actor is um, I was playing someone whose agency had been taken away from him. So there aren't many scenes where I think like, you know what I'd like is some chocolate ice cream right now. And I go down to the street and I get myself some chocolate ice cream. People are force feeding me, in a sense, throughout the movie, pulling me around, inviting me to places, handing me drinks. And so that's the biggest challenge as an actor is because a lot of the way an actor becomes known to an audience is by making choices. I like chocolate ice cream. I particularly like this woman. I hate my job you know, and being able to act against those things. So for me, the biggest difference in this was just having to work on relationship given circumstances, LSD, you know. I mean, LSD <laughs> makes the whole thing a lot uh, easier, in a sense. Are you saying you were on LSD <laughs> during the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the entirety of filming. We're trying to get people to watch it. Yes. Microdosing is a big thing right now, so <laughs> maybe that's possible. Uh, 
who decides what micro is? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> it's different for different people. Yeah, here's <laughs> macro. I think the difference between these, um, these, this, this films, for lack of a better word, reenactments versus something like like Jackie, which you're referring to, is that there is an assumed truth to Jackie that you are recreating, even though it's been scripted and there are some things that are, you know, maybe written. In that movie, that all the scenes are things that really happened. Yeah, yeah. It's ridiculous. There, okay. there are many things that happen in that movie that there's no public record of. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yeah. absolutely. But with this, the foundation of the story is a lie that was told to this man. And so we are watching through you guys, the actors, mutations. variations of all uh -huh. the different lies that he sort of parsed together. Choose your own adventure, they used to call it. <laughs> children's That's exactly books. what it yeah. is. <laughs> well, it's a blank box. You know, the center of the story is this hotel room. Uh, um, 1018A, what actually happened in that hotel room? Was Frank Olson murdered? Did he commit suicide? Was it an accident? Um, so the entire movie is my attempt to address that question. Um, the world is a kind of black box, and we're trying to look into that black box and figure out, in this case, the past. Um, when you're investigating, it's not as if you say to yourself, I can do this, but I can't do that. Or this is an appropriate technique, but that isn't. Everything goes. Anything that you can bring to bear and thinking about a mystery, to me, is fair game. And getting a lot of smart actors and a good script together um, it, it's interesting about reenactments. <clears throat> They're used in courtrooms all the time in order to help juries understand or visualize what might have happened in a crime. Um, here we're doing something a little bit like that. We're trying to give the audience the material to think about the case in a deeper and more meaningful way. And if you don't like it, no, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting is having played some, a lot of people who committed a lot of crimes. I've had an entire career of people that have committed various crimes. And some of them based off of real people is I have felt sometimes because your job as an actor is to make the irrational makes sense, is to make the violent act have some reason that you're, you know, if it were, I, they need really good actors for those reenactments for the courts. You need actors to really get inside of it. Are you looking for a job? <laughs> I'm just thinking, just going back, thinking I could have represented a lot of people. Ladies and gentlemen, playing the defendant, Peter Sarsgaard, <laughs> come on and come on in. <laughs> Errol, what is it uh, like making a, um, a film, a, a series, um, about the sort of uh, misdeeds of the CIA in a sort of current cultural moment where even those of us most skeptical of the CIA's past and, you know, e e even what they do currently are sort of forced to defend them due to the, the person that's currently in office? Things have gotten pretty bad out there, seemingly. Um, when you reach the point where the CIA starts to look like the good guys. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> um, it could all be bad. I mean, we live at a time where trust, I would say, is... Um, we trust nothing, and maybe wisely so. Um, the proliferation of material on the internet. Um, who's to know what's true and what's false? There's one thing that I do know, despite what you hear and what you read, there's still truth. Truth hasn't suffered at all. It remains very much intact. Uh, we may have a hard time at ascertaining the truth, figuring out what's true, but it's there, and that we have to go after it to the best of our abilities. Um, 
we have a government that tries to undermine the whole notion of truth, but that's a bad, bad thing. I think one of the things with, uh, with this story is uh, tracing it back to the sort of original sin of lying about his death leads Eric Olson into this place of conspiratorial thinking eventually. And it felt very reflective of kind of the moment that we're in right now as a, as a country in the way that we've gotten extremely conspiratorial because we feel somewhat lied to consistently and we're constantly trying to piece so many different pieces of truth and lies together that we go down our own sort of rabbit holes, if you will. Uh, there's a set of Russian dolls here, stories inside of stories inside of stories. A story about this one man, Eric Olson, and his 60-year quest to figure out what happened to his father. A story about the family, more or less destroyed by what happened to the father. And a story about America, what happened to us uh, f following our amazing victories in World War II, we descended into a cold war. Um, I would say that we're still in that cold war. Um, I used to read the web pages um, of um, the John Birch Society, and I worried about them. I thought, what's going to happen to these people after the fall of the Soviet Union? What will they do with themselves? They don't have, they don't have an arch Satan anymore to deal with. They're going to be so lonely, <laughs> so bereft, and um, not to worry. They, um, what's the new current fashionable word? They pivoted immediately. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, it was Islam, Islamophobia, a new Satan. We never run out of our creative resources in terms of imagining evil, never, ever fail us. But, you know, what if the evil is ourselves? Then what? Oh, boy. <laughs> Let's get some questions from the audience. Who's a question out here? <laughs> He's Hi full guys. of answers. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm really looking forward to tuning in to the series. Thank you. I was wondering, um, are there any other stories you would like to tell in this sort of docudrama anthology series? Yes. Are you going to pay for them? <laughs> no, there are many, many, many stories that I would like to tell. Now, having s developed this new way of telling nonfiction, um, I'd like to continue doing it. Turns out to be expensive. <laughs> However, I compared believe Compared to what? Compared to what? <laughs> Transformers 4, yes. No. I didn't buy the Leonardo da Vinci <laughs> out of my price yeah. range. I thought, I can't spend that much. It's, it's, it's one really of the bad nice. ones, too. It's it would look good in there. my living room, but I can't afford it. What was, it, what was it like for you directing actors versus, I mean, since you hadn't done it in quite some time, what was it like for you being on set? And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of commercials. Should I brag about it? You are? No. <laughs> He's worked with actors. Got it, got it. I have. Maybe these guys were great. I was really fortunate. I'm not just saying it. I was really fortunate to have this crew, each and every one of them. They were great. We had so little time. We were rushing against the clock constantly. There's a scene that I wanted to do with Molly that I felt was really important. I asked her if she would do it. She also realized that this was an important scene. And we just did it really, really, really quickly without adequate preparation, with adequate discussion. We just did it. And geez louise, it was great. You Can I ask what great. scene? I'm always amazed looking at it, how good it is. And that happened. What scene? That's, I mean, that's part of what makes, you know, working in any independent film fun. And the obstacles that get in, you know, there's all these obstacles. There's never enough time and never enough money. And you, you do what you can in the moment of doing it, you know. And 
I mean, it's so fun to watch Errol direct because the, the, it's not a film. It's, it's a six-part show. I keep wanting to call it a film, but it, it is cinematic in the way that it looks. It is so beautiful to look at and to watch him create just these visual spaces to tell the story, you know, that we sort of inhabit was also just a real pleasure. Once I remember Peter and I were sitting in the living room of the house. It felt like it had been a while since we'd done anything and sort of looked over and Errol and his cinematographer were shooting like this tea kettle and there was some steam coming. I mean, but it was, I was like, it's, they've been shooting that tea kettle for a long time, but it's, beautiful in the film and it tells the story you know and I just I, I, I want to go back quickly to this this idea of truth and seeking truth because I think that outside of being an actor people think of actors as as liars as people who can lie well and all the good actors I know are trying to find some truth in the artificial circumstance that they're given but it is about seeking truth, being an actor. It's about finding like just what is real about being a human being and sharing that on some level. And so for, you know, I, for me, that's so much about what was interesting about doing this work and, and, and it's circular. You can just go around and around talking about it. But I think that's, um, in that way, I think this, this show, this film really supports there being actors in it, drama in it. An essential part. And there's a misconception about truth, and I may have fostered it by what I said earlier, so I'll take it all back. <laughs> um, because I do agree with Molly that we live in a sea of lies, but lies can be a vehicle to finding truth. And using actors in Wormwood, to me, is a very powerful way of telling the story, thinking about the story. Um, one of the things that I really worried about, this is interesting with respect to what you were saying, I worried about how can you mix all of these things together? How can you mix the drama mm -hmm. with uh, home movies, with archival material, interviews, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and maybe my favorite thing in the film, um, uh, uh, my apologies to Peter and Christian, but it's with Molly. And <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> she's thinking, uh, she, she blinks momentarily. This is a scene. Um, uh, a very, very powerful scene where she is being um, confronted by uh, members of the CIA. She blinks and we cut to home movies of the Olsen family and it's seamless. Um, I think it's seamless for many, many reasons good part of it is Molly's performance. I buy into this whole thing. I buy into her as Alice Olsen in that moment, thinking back over her past. And to me, that's quite remarkable that these actors, whether it's Christian in the bathroom, which are some of the more powerful scenes I've ever seen, or Peter saying nothing at the allergist slash psychiatrist office. <laughs> Um, I was very much influenced by a movie Peter did in education where he sits in the car at the end saying absolutely nothing. And it's one of the most powerful things I've ever seen in the movies. So I can't say hats off because you're the one with the hat. <laughs> but hats off. Uh, next question. Uh, Mr. Morris, my question is for you. When in your lifetime did it become so apparent that facts were going to be such a big uh, place in your work? And did you ever envision that creating documentaries like The Thin Blue Line would have the effects that it did? 
There's a question about the Thin Blue Line. Um, when I got money, I hadn't made movies in six or seven years. I was an out-of-work filmmaker working as a private detective. And I got money to go to Dallas and interview this psychiatrist who has this friendly name, Dr. Death. And I said, oh, thank God I don't have to be a private detective anymore. And that was the beginning of two, three years of investigation, um, often with a camera. Um, did I think that it could result with this man being released from prison? I certainly hoped it could, because this was a man who came within two days of being electrocuted in old Sparky, the Texas electric chair. Um, I came to believe he was innocent and I was able to prove that he was innocent and actually to get him out of jail. Um, it doesn't happen every day, but I worked really, really, really hard. I'm proud of my movie, The Thin Blue Line. I'm even more proud of the investigation. It was a really damn good investigation. Um, but I've always been obsessed with facts. Maybe I was born that way. Um, probably there's a mystery in everybody's life that they can't quite figure out. Uh, one of the central mysteries in my life is my father died when I was two years old. Pictures all around the house. The doctor died of a, a sudden massive coronary. Um, I would always look at these pictures and wonder who is this guy? I've never met him. I have no memory of him whatsoever. Who is he? Um, and the kind of mystery that you know is at the heart of your life that informs who you are, how you see the world, how you think about the world, um, and yet a mystery that maybe you can never answer. Maybe that's the start of it. Next question. It's our last question. Hi. Um, so uh, in doing research for this film and um, or, or in, in the performances, uh, did you get to talk to any of the actual people that were related to the events that happened? And uh, was there any feedback from the CIA on whether on what you could or couldn't show or talk about? Someone asked me if I had approached the CIA about this story. <laughs> I'm glad someone finds this funny. I mean, it's a story about how the CIA has lied for 60 years about the circumstances of Frank Olson's death. And what do they imagine? Do have much to say about it? <laughs> well, they could say, oh, I'm really glad you asked. Finally, we were waiting <laughs> for someone to bring this up. Oh, yeah, we killed him. Thanks for asking. No, I just didn't quite see the point of it. Um, but yes, the, the central figure in this entire series, the central figure in Wormwood, is Eric Olson, Frank Olson's son, who has spent his entire life investigating his father's death. Yeah. Who you decided not to use the Interotron on, right? You're, you're, the, the interviews look a little bit different than, than how you, you... They always look different in each film, but in this film it's particularly different without the in, Interotron. Yeah, I didn't want to use it. <laughs> Instead he used like 10 cameras going at once. You also shot yourself in the interviews as well. What, what made you do that? Not with a gun. No. <laughs> with, the, with a camera. It always gets the interview going. Although the... <laughs> Here's something to, to talk this? about. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see what he just did? <laughs> Amazing. Just Thoughts? Kind of yeah, well, I keep thinking, if you're going to shoot yourself anyway, <laughs> somewhere, unless really you're trying to put an end to it all, the foot is probably as good a place as any. It gives you a chance for certain revisions. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Don't you have also? Don't you have a massive artery in, in your in your foot, though? Couldn't you couldn't you potentially die from a gunshot wound? To see, I knew he was going to get technical on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not prepared to defend it. <laughs> um, 
Um, I mean, the, the thing you can see about Errol, and I've thought about this knowing him, you know, over two years or so, um, is the way that he the way that he has changed the tenor of the way everyone felt in this room from the time we've started doing this interview, <laughs> the, the world that you walk into when, when being with Errol is the world that we're in, in in some of the film. I mean, some filmmakers, what makes a great filmmaker is being a great leader in a sense, and a lot of people think that's like rah, 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 and carry the sword over your head or something, or it can just be to radically change the tenor, the quality of things in the air. And I think if you're being interviewed by Errol, I imagine there are massive places where you could get off to telling some long story and he would just sit there and listen to you. And you could just, like with the case of Rumsfeld, just like gradually hang yourself in front of him. And it's incredible to watch. I would never have the patience to let Rumsfeld hang himself because I would want to do it for him too badly, you know. But what about the, like, no, you know, it doesn't work well. <laughs> this works much better. Is that one of the things that you found with this, with this format, this length, that you could allow for uh, a lot greater of tangents from, from your subject? Sure. I love having this canvas, a much bigger uh, amount of time than I've ever had to work with before. And it does allow me to to do so many diverse things, to work with actors, to have extensive interviews, um, to have quotations from Sir Lawrence Olivier's Hamlet, uh, among other things. You ask me, I never got a chance to answer because I never really answer any question. That's my occupational hazard. <laughs> um, but. Um, Wait, can I ask, when did that occupational oh, hazard start, considering you're asking people questions all the time and looking for answers? Someone told when did you realize it would be bad for you to give answers? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, someone taught me very early on the word apasiopesis. Not, not an answer. Not an answer. You start a sentence and you never finish it. Um, you get distracted somewhere along the way. Uh, you go into one tangent or, or another. You asked me about why no Interatron. Interatron was designed for first person interviews. It was when I was making a film about one person. You know, people ask me, well, why didn't you interview someone other than Donald Rumsfeld? Or why didn't you interview someone other than Robert S. McNamara? And the answer is because I didn't want to. You can't make me, I didn't want to. I want to make a movie with one person and the device that I used was ideally suited to that end. Here, I wanted to make a movie about collage, a movie about the thousands of shards and scraps of evidence that go into thinking about a crime. I wanted to create something different, and the multiple cameras seemed to be a way to do that. And that has something to do with Eric's collage method, yeah. obviously the subject. Always, always looking for a metaphor somewhere. That's my tragic flaw. <laughs> I, think it's, well, I think it's what creates the, the beauty of so much of your films, is you're able to find He's turning metaphors. nice. <laughs> he was always nice. He was always nice. He too. was always that was nice. True. Always that was nice. quite nice. <laughs> Um, guys, I, I love Wormwood. It's a massive achievement. It's really beautiful, incredible, incredible metaphors, sir, that you found. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you so very much. Yeah. Uh, it comes to Netflix December 15th. I believe that's this Friday, right, for people to check out and binge it. It's amazing. It's six chapters. They're all beautiful. You won't be able to stop watching it. Give them a round of applause, everybody.